Welcome back to FE8 Low Tiers, where we'll be kicking off the new chapter by promoting Ross. Generally, the Pirate promotion is better for Ross than Fighter. Pirate immediately gains a point of speed on promotion, and it gives him the ability to walk on water, giving him new mobility routes on select chapters. However, the Pirate promotes using an Ocean Seal, while the Fighter promotes using a Hero's Crest. We'll only get one Ocean Seal this playthrough, and we're unfortunately going to have to save it for Calm. For that reason, I choose the fighter, and Ross does not gain any speed on promotion. This leaves him a little lopsided, but still highly usable. He has enough bulk to take maybe two hits, and he has the highest strength stat in the army. The game finally gives us access to the preparations menu, allowing us to not deploy the units we won't be using for this challenge, so we won't have to get them out of the way anymore. Unfortunately, we're forced to deploy our new unit, Artur, and we won't be using him. Artur is probably the best of the unpromoted mages. He joins early on and isn't very difficult to train, and typically has a good mix of both magic and speed when leveled. Additionally, the bishop promotion has a lot of utility, since it propels him immediately to C-rank staves and gives him tripled weapon damage against monsters. Since he's very useful both for combat and staff use, he's too good to use for our challenge. We'll be recruiting another unit this chapter, but not until we reach the lower left village. Fortunately for us, there's no time limit. In fact, crossing the river triggers a wave of proximity-based reinforcements from the top left corner. I'll have to keep Artur in careful positioning so he won't accidentally enter combat. I split up my army to deal with all of the enemy units in the north half. There's going to be reinforcements arriving on turn 2, so I want to make sure all of these enemies are taken care of before they arrive. Since I spent the entirety of Chapter 3 focusing on Ross, neglecting Colm and Nime, I'm going to use this chapter as an opportunity to hopefully get them off of their feet. I have to play this chapter pretty slowly. Even if I wanted the rush forward of Gilliam, the enemy Mogals deal magical damage, which would pose a serious threat. However, their speed is nearly zero, so if I move up Ross with the hatchet, he can take care of both of them in enemy phase. I let Ross do most of the work, and move the rest of my units to the left side of the map to carefully try and feed Nime a few more kills. The enemy skeleton reinforcements on the right side of the map actually wield lances, so Ross on a forest is unlikely to take any real sort of damage from them. We've taken the slow and safe route for all of the chapters so far, but that's going to have to end soon. Both Chapter 5 and Chapter 6 have timed side objectives that grant us valuable promotional items. We're going to have to book it much faster, even though our units are still pretty weak. As a result, future chapters should be significantly more exciting in terms of both gameplay and strategy, and our weaker units like Colm and Nime are going to have to start pulling their weight. By this point, I've taken care of most of the aggressive enemies on the map, so it's perfectly safe to trigger the extra reinforcements that attack me from the back. I can do this by moving a unit across the river. Erika looks available. I have Ross pull back a bit to help deal with the back reinforcements, and also to try and set up a perfect killing shot for Nime. Also, Gilliam has gained his third point of speed. That's a 30% growth, it just keeps going up. I can't help but feel that at least one unit in this playthrough will get so RNG blessed that someone is going to tell me that there actually weren't low tier after all, when I just simply got very lucky. Also, these zombies are very polite. They formed an orderly queue and just lined up to be slaughtered one by one. While Fire Emblem 8 is perhaps one of my favorite Fire Emblem games, the start is, admittedly, kind of boring. To be honest, if you use these early chapters as an opportunity to train weak units, they can be kind of tedious, and if you just run through them with Seth, they're kind of boring on account of not really having any challenge. Thankfully, I'm expecting the game to pick up considerably on the next chapter. One thing of note that has happened on this chapter, Nime has actually been gaining strength. If Nime's early levels don't gain you any points of strength, she ends up nigh unusable, so I'm very thankful for this. In the village down here, we're about to recruit a new unit. Loot's popular among fans, but I consider her to be roughly mid-tier, maybe a little higher. While her magic growth is enormous, it takes a bit more effort to train her up at first than Artur, since she's one of the game's most fragile units, and she doesn't have enough con before promoting to use even the lightest tomes without slowing down somewhat. She typically has nuclear offensive potential at higher levels, and she can even get a horse on promotion, so she's definitely much too good to use in our challenge. All that's left is to take care of the two remaining enemies, and we'll finally be out of this chapter. I creep my units towards the boss slowly with the intention of setting up one last kill for Nime. 
I've had Kolm and Nime hold hands all chapter to build up support rank. Unfortunately, I haven't gotten their beast support yet. Maybe next chapter. I have Nime take down the boss and she gets yet another strength level up. That's a point of strength every level so far. That chapter was pretty short, so why don't we move directly on to chapter 5? Chapter 5 brings us two new units to recruit, Natasha and Joshua. Natasha is a far inferior version of Mulder. Some people might make the argument that any healer has enough utility to not be considered bad, but I need to spin up the propaganda machine so I can justify using healer before chapter 11. Natasha's staff rank is far inferior to Mulder's since she joins in a later chapter with a lower rank. Additionally, it takes a lot of dedicated effort to train her to promotion since she also joins at level 1. In a playthrough without grinding, we're not going to promote her anytime soon, severely hampering her potential with her restrictions in place. Even as a bishop, she's further flawed by her very low con stat offsetting her seemingly decent speed stat, further compounded by the high weight of light magic tomes, making us lose between 1 to 10 points of speed. Her main draw is her 60% magic growth, but her base magic stat is so low that we might not even hit double digits by the time she's a bishop. Given her dubious potential to be used effectively in combat, we'll be using her for this run. Joshua is a unit I consider to be solidly mid-tier, so he's probably too good to be used in this playthrough. His base stats are actually pretty good for this point in the game, and he can immediately go to work doubling and killing enemies. His main flaw is that he's yet another infantry unit stuck exclusively using swords at close range, which can be a bit of an issue since he isn't particularly defensive, and Sacred Stone sees a lot of action happen on the enemy phase. He doesn't keep up with the really good units, but he's a bit too good for me to include him in our run. Chapter 5 has four villages I can visit for loot, however I have to protect them from the bandits that spawn in at turns 2, 6, and 8. If I manage to protect all four villages, I'll get an extra reward at the end of the chapter. There's an alternate passage on the left side of the map, but I'll be ignoring it. I don't have the units to split up my army so heavily, and the bandits will be spawning on the right side of the map regardless. The bandits AI in this chapter prioritizes attacking player units as opposed to burning down the houses. However, this only applies if you have a character within range. I decide to let Erica solo a couple enemies on the left, and then move the rest of my units towards the right. There's more units to deal with here, several of which will be charging, and enemy bandit reinforcements on turn 2. I'll have to be careful about how I approach the center. Joshua with his killing edge could take out any of my units in a single round of combat, so don't have a way to safely bait him towards me to recruit him with Natasha. However, his AI is configured to never attack Natasha, so if I can take out the surrounding soldiers, I can charge her in to get the recruitment safely. One of these two bandits has unusually high stats, making the pair of them dangerous enough that even Ross might die in two hits. I'll have to position my units carefully to distribute the incoming damage. Thankfully, if I'm able to take care of these two bandits right here, I don't need to divert one of my units to the cell village. I can always backtrack once I'm in a more stable position. I triple check my mental math and finally commit to a plan. I send Ross to fight the soldiers and I'm going to form a bit of a wall with Gilliam and Colm. Colm's getting an extra point of defense, both from the weapon triangle advantage and from the forest, so even if he was unlucky enough to take both hits, he would still survive. I prefer to go for consistent strategies when possible. I only like to rely on luck if I'm very desperate. Once I've taken out the enemies charging me, I'm going to try and lure out the two fighters surrounding Joshua without aggroing Joshua himself. That will give me the freedom to move in Natasha without having her take any hits and dying. Checking the fighters by Joshua, the strongest hit is only 16 damage. She can actually take one hit without dying. If there's only one enemy remaining near Joshua, I am safe to charge her in without worry for her survival. And given the ticking time limit on later waves of bandit reinforcements near the top right corner of the map, I think I might have to do it. I move Ross to lure out the fighter on the right side of Joshua, allowing me to charge Natasha past his position once I've killed it on player phase. If everything goes correctly, Joshua won't aggro on anyone and I'll be able to turn him into a blue unit so I won't die. I finally gain the confidence to move Natasha into Joshua's range to go for the recruitment. Unfortunately, I make a rather serious blunder. For reasons I can't describe, for some reason I thought Joshua couldn't clear the forest tile, and Gilliam is within range. Gilliam had 28 HP there, and Joshua is hitting 7s with around a 30% crit rate. Had Gilliam taken both hits and one of them was a critical hit, I would have had him die right there and then. 
Thankfully, I've cleared out the entire center of the map, just in time to advance on these bandit reinforcements and intercept them before they get to any of the villages. Since I can't use Joshua for this playthrough, I have him relinquish his inventory into the convoy. That killing edge might come in handy. We're not completely out of the woods here. The next pair of bandit reinforcements spawn soon and on the very top right corner of the map behind several enemies I still haven't killed. I'll have to lure out the soldiers in front first. There's five enemies to deal with and I can't take them all on in one turn. I place Gilliam and Ross to lure out and kill the soldiers while I prepare the run-in of Colm and Erica to take out the axe-wielding units. However, I am a bit cautious. Three axe wielders could easily take out either Colm or Erica if I get unlucky, so I decide to play it a bit safe. I don't actually have to take care of both bandits on this turn. While they're quite close to the upper house, they can't quite make it inside, only to the doorstep. And if I can get another unit within their attack range next turn, they'll turn around and fight me instead. Once these two bandits are taken care of, there's nothing really left to worry about. The rest of the enemies on the chapter are stationary and not really a threat. Might be a good opportunity to get Nime a few more kills. I'm actually quite pleased with my Nime. As I mentioned last chapter, she's actually gained strength every single level up. With her low base strength of 4, she's nearly unusable if she doesn't gain strength in the early levels because she doesn't have enough damage to really kill anything. However, we might get enough early momentum to get her rolling. I run around and collect all of the loot from the villages which are now safe from the bandits. In total, we collect an armor slayer, a secret book, a torch, and a draco shield. There's something else I'd like to point out as we clean up the remaining enemies. Take a look at my Gilliam here. That is 7 points of speed. His base speed stat is 3. Given that Gilliam joins at level 4, we've only leveled him up 5 times. We've hit his speed growth 4 out of 5 levels, and it's only a 30% chance. For the remainder of the chapter, I grab the B support for Kolm and Nime for an extra point of damage, and I decide to go shopping. I need a steel bow for Nime and a steel sword for Kolm. I should take a moment to explain supports, as I've been going for them on Colm and Nime, as they're the only valid pair in my army that can actually get support bonuses. Characters gain bonuses if they're within three tiles of their support partner, and the bonus that they gain is based on their support affinity. Nime and Colm actually make for very good support partners, as their pair, Fire and Light, gives them a combination of attack and accuracy on both ends. I feed this kill to Nime, and she gains another point of strength. We've actually doubled her base strength stat in a very short amount of time. The average Nime by this level would have around 6 strength. You see, Fire Emblem is just a very random game. Sometimes a bad unit gets a series of very good level ups, and they end up being a good unit, although maybe just for that one playthrough. For me, that's the beauty of the random growth system. It helps create unique storylines for each unit as you go through a playthrough, as their unique level ups might make them better or worse in ways you didn't really expect, making every playthrough just a little bit different. Having finally cleared out the entire chapter, gotten all the loot, and gone shopping, we can kill the boss of Frost. Having saved every single village, we get a guiding ring as an additional reward. Time to move on to Chapter 5X.